CityCast from Explicity. Mary, write that they nailed the left wrist first. I heard the sound I made as I broke, my blood and beloved bones leaving me at last. I was tied to the beam so long, the feeling in my hands had died. Odd mercy when they hammered in the nail. I no longer knew wrist or hand or arm. I knew only pain, as vast and old as the sky. I no longer cared about the body I had borrowed and loved. Its time had passed, as all things passed. I was conscious only of the breaking. They placed one foot over the other and I felt in my calves the strangeness of the posture. I felt the twist of pleasure. I heard myself. I was inside the sound of my splintering. Right, Mary, that everything follows from that moment. The death, the return, the centuries of turmoil and ecstasy. At the moment I fell into the dream and the dream became real. I remembered that when I was a child of seven, we went to a town nearby and on the way back, we stopped at an inn. I saw a family eating their evening meal. I saw the look on the face of the woman as she put a morsel into her mouth and chewed and the words came to me unbidden. Take me, Abba. I wish only to die. This is what my mother said, the angel said, and I say it to you, Mary. I learned the ways of men, for they were easy to learn. I learned to disdain the moaning bed, the want and begetting followed by the usual oblivion, the wine and feasting followed by the usual remorse. I learned more in the desert than ever I learned in the houses of men. And I say unto you, who hear these words, two hundred or two thousand years after me, what good are the victuals if you cannot eat them, but a stranger takes and eats and is satisfied? This is the way of vanity and darkness. You may be the master of a hundred houses, and yet your name will be darkness. For how can you feast when your brother fasts? How can you laugh when your brother's house is in mourning and your mother tears herself from brokenheartedness? How can you love when your brother, your child, hangs above you, splintered across? What you just heard was my guest, Jeet Thail, reading from his book, Names of the Women, women whose paths had crossed with Christ, and who, it is said, stayed by him during the crucifixion and after. I have been fortunate to read so many books since I started hosting this podcast. Each book as wonderful and as compelling as the next. And then a book comes along, like Names of the Women, that holds the craft of writing to a higher standard. Let me tantalizingly cycle back to that in a minute. Now, I don't need to introduce Jeet Thiel. There's just too much to say. Google him. Penguin had sent me a copy of a book compiled and edited by Jeet, the Penguin Book of Indian Poets, an almost 1,000-page thick compendium of Indian poetry. This magnificent tome was years in the making, and I'm sure it will be around for years for the taking. There is a link in the podcast description to this already successful book. When I had gone to interview Jeet's father, the famous journalist and author T.J.S. George, an earlier guest on this podcast, Jeet gave me a copy of his book, Names of the Women. And it gave me the chills in a way that very few books have done before. Names of the Women is a hauntingly evocative story of the lives of those women during the time of Christ. Despite being less than 200 pages long, Names of the Women is aching to be a book three times its length. Its substance is such. And when you pack all that in into less than 200 pages, it makes it that much more powerful. 
Ji Tile's writing is a masterclass in narrative storytelling, rich with literary devices that enhance his already compelling and well honed and well practiced craft. Well, so much for what I think about the book. Let's talk to Jeet. Here he is, joining me in our mutual hometown, Bangalore. Jeet Tile, it is an honor to have you as my guest. Welcome to the literary city. Thank you, Ramji. It's a real pleasure to be here. When I read your, make that reread your book, Narcopolis, I remembered that the whole prologue was one sentence. Six and a half page sentence. Right. And more specifically, and I counted, 2,292 words. Wow. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. And uh, no punctuation other than commas. I noticed that. No semicolons, no M dashes. No M dashes. Only commas. Right. I know from literature trivia that uh, James Joyce in Ulysses and uh, I think Thomas Pynchon in Gravity's Rainbow each wrote sentences more than 4,000 words long. Yes. So if you disallow punctuation that actually breaks a sentence into smaller sentences effectively, have you written the longest known sentence in all of English literature? I'm not sure about that. But I I think I can say that I wrote an an honest sentence in that there's no cheating involved. Mm -hmm. There are as I said, there are no end dashes, there are no semicolons, right. and there are no ellipses. Whereas that 50-page sentence that ends Ulysses, that is not a real sentence. You know, there's a lot of uh, poetic license there. You know, that said, uh, writing a six-page long sentence and holding everyone's attention is s- some craft. Craft seems central to all of your writing. Let's talk about craft. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Jeet, I have read your writing for a very long time, actually, right from the days that you wrote a column in Gentleman magazine. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's yeah. right. You know, 90s. Wow. Yes. I used to write infrequently at the time for National Magazine. I remember. Yeah. yeah you know, like Debonair yes. and others when I wanted. Yeah. Now, I don't know who to attribute this to, but when a famous author was once asked, is writing art or craft, he replied, yes. <laughs> I think that might be the only way to reply to that question. I submit. I mean, it is, of course, it's both. It, it's one thing on a Monday, and it's something else on Monday night. Nice. Now, a good carpenter is one who knows how to use his tools yeah. well. A, a bad carpenter will make a bad table. Mm-hmm. When it comes to writers, what are the tools that a writer should employ in terms of improving craft? I think it has everything to do with uh, reading, how much you've read and which writers you've read. And that's just the way it is. We are shaped by the stories we read. I, I know I am, and I, I know that I've been reading a certain kind of story from the age of about 12 or 13, and that has never changed. Uh, I read other kinds of stories as well now, but there's one kind of story that's been consistent, and that is a kind of a literary story where you know that the writer has paid attention, in fact, paid a lot of attention to the sentence. To each sentence. To each sentence. And that it is the sentence that is the building block of that novel, rather than plot or characterization or uh, a sense of an epic. You know that it's a sentence. And there are writers who can do both. I'm thinking of someone like Pynchon, for example. I'm thinking of Salman Rushdie, uh, who can do that epic kind of world building and word building, but also works on the uh, level of the sentence, each sentence. And that for me is really, uh, it's a very exciting thing to do. And it's a very calming and uh, humble thing to do, to work on that cellular level. Mm. I I also... uh, it struck me when you were talking about the carpenter and the table. Yes. Right. That uh, somebody mentioned to me that Johnson once said that you don't have to be a carpenter to critique a table. <laughs> I didn't know. But do you agree with it? My reply to that would be, you don't have to be a carpenter to critique a table, but it helps. So by that reckoning, book reviewers are people who ought to be able to write books. In fact, exactly. And I think It might be uh, an interesting thing if we were to give books to people who have only written books. 
in the same way a music critic should be chosen how wonderful would it be if only musicians reviewed music well they actually did that yeah. for cricket commentary didn't they exactly yeah so back to your literary influences yeah. growing up which books which authors um at first they were authors on my father's bookshelf and we moved a lot in when i was a child we moved from uh various indian cities we ended up in bombay then we moved to hong kong then we moved to new york then back to hong kong various houses in hong kong and then back to india but he always brought his library along so the first books i read were uh i remember he had a copy of the collected poems of dylan thomas and i read that at the age of 13 and got very very excited uh because i think dylan thomas is the kind of poet that particularly um appeals to young readers because you see what he's doing with language and you see the risks he's taking you see how headlong that flight is uh, how there's no safety net underneath how often it doesn't work but when it does it's uh, it's a miracle and i read uh, dylan thomas i read other books of poems that my father had although he claimed to not understand poetry which is you know something people say when they don't want to talk about poetry hmm. poetry is not something you need to understand it's something you either like or you don't that's it end of story there's nothing to understand and whenever people tell you oh you know yeah yeah that's very nice poets poetry but i don't understand it basically they just don't want to talk about it which is fine my father used to say that a lot but he had poetry in his library and that was the first thing that i read and he also had a uh, ulysses he had mm. which we still have actually it's the first edition of ulysses hardcover from wow yeah from uh, the 30s i think first or second edition yeah and uh, he had uh henry james he had some of the russians so i had a early education in the the classicists i think in my team and i think that may have had everything to do with the fact that one of the things i remember from my teens is my father telling me about that 50 page sentence that ends ulysses and he talked about it with such awe and delight and 35 years later when i came to write my first novel i'm sure that all would have had would have played some part in my head when i wrote the prologue to my cup i can see that would happen and for our listeners the father being referred to as i said in the monologue is the famous journalist tjs george who was my guest on the show he was if you'll scroll you'll find this episode fascinating gentleman 94 years yeah. old doesn't look a day over pick a number <laughs> okay you've read all the classicists but i perceive that uh, they have been building blocks to your own literary style uh, which is very adaptable so would you accept the label experimental author i'm i'm quite happy with that uh, with that label because it's so wide yeah. it encompasses so much right uh, and i think it it certainly apply, applies to my fiction more than my poetry mm -hmm. the poetry i think is fairly i won't say conventional but formalist okay not experimental whereas the prose is certainly experimental let's get some examples of experimental authors virginia wolf gertrude stein you know they use devices like fragmentation and repetition and uh, jorge borges who bent time and space absolutely yeah i i agree that he's an experimental author but the thing about reading borges is it has that carved in stone quality where you feel these words have existed before time he's a uh, an experimentalist in the guise of a classicist and it's similar to what you do isn't it uh, in your books three of which i read before this interview narcopolis the book of chocolate saints and names of the women each one of them is distinct i'm so glad uh, the book of chocolate saints is part of that list because you know i think in many ways for me that is probably the the most important for me in that list why uh, for one thing it is an epic i'll say 
I, I, I tried things in that book that I don't think I would have the courage to try ever again. Uh -huh. And I worked harder on that book than I have on any other book in my life. The Book of Chocolate Saints is the only book that I can look at now and not feel the overwhelming need to edit. <laughs> now, isn't that the bane of existence? <laughs> okay, I'd like to talk about names of the women. By the way, thank you so much for giving me a copy of your book. Oh, such a pleasure. That book got me. I, I couldn't put it down. Thanks so much. I'd like to quote from page 14 of the book, these lines. And so it is that Peter will go to the cave and find no body there, nothing except the linen in which they wrapped him. They will leave out the story of the woman who was the first to enter the tomb, but they will not be able to erase completely the name of the woman. This particular passage represents the uh, the, the credo of... Uh, of the entire novel. Yeah, you're right. Right? Yeah. It's easy to fall to banalities and reductionist expressions like feminist viewpoint yeah. to uh, describe this novel. Absolutely. It's more than that. It's humanity. I mentioned credo. Did you have a particular credo when you wrote this book? I did. I, I'd always wanted to write a, a fictional account of the New Testament because the New Testament is one of the texts that I know inside out. That's clear. And it struck me um, quite early on that the New and the Old Testament, actually, is a very one-sided account of these stories, and it, they are so centered around the male character. Right. And even when a woman enters the story and does something absolutely crucial to the life of Christ, you, you know nothing about her. You don't know her name. You don't know why she was there when she was and it is uh it just struck me as a kind of vacuum you know a black hole and right uh, i i'm so glad you didn't use the word feminist it is not about feminism it's about an imaginative uh, rendering or re-rendering of a story where everybody each character is equal and is given an equal backstory and is given an equal uh, importance in the life Christ. Who's to say that the woman who put that coin on the blanket, mm -hmm. the widow, the widow, yes, isn't as important as Paul or one of the main disciples, uh, who really, if you follow those stories, they really didn't do very much. In fact, at the most important moments, they deserted him, they betrayed him, they proved themselves time and again to be cowards. Right. The the women never did that. Mm. They. They gave up everything to follow him. And, you know, when you look at it that way, it just seems like such a, an injustice mm -hmm. on the part of all those men who wrote those stories some 50 to 100 years after the death of Christ. All of those stories were written by men. And mm -hmm. you can see that prejudice and that uh, bias playing out in the way those stories are written. That's true of so much of historical narrative, isn't it? Absolutely. I yeah. found that the narrative in this book has a kind of visceral, visual quality to it, almost as though the scenes were playing in your head as you wrote the novel. Nice. I like that. Yeah. In fact, uh, very interesting you should say that about names of the women, because I did write it as I saw it. It is a very visual book. Yes, the scenes are vivid. also have a kind of a confession to make. Mm -hmm. While I was writing this book, the, the one thing I did other than read was watch Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, that's cool. So, the epicness of it all. The epicness of that and the, the violence of it. And, you know, I think it might have bled into this in, in ways I'm too... <laughs> bled into it. Uh, ...blind to see. That's amazing. And it explains a lot. There's a certain biblical vastness to your prose. And by that I mean epic in substance rather than being ecclesiastical. Uh, would you say that's uh, yeah. reasonable? Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. So my Cecil B. DeMille reference is not misplaced. At all. In fact, it's right on the money. And don't know if it was a good idea 
for me to mention Games of Tro- uh, Game of Thrones, <laughs> but how could I not? Because <laughs> no, it's great. You're absolutely right. It was written like a visual rendering of of something watched. And another thing that this book was not influenced by your personal experiences as your other books have. Yeah, definitely. In a book of chocolate saints, sure. uh, all those characters are real, aren't they? They are absolutely real. I recognize some. I'm glad. I'm so glad. But you know, that's the thing. I think only an Indian reader of a certain bent of mind will be able to identify even a half a dozen of those. Mm, quite right. The the point I'm making is that those books were very personal to you yeah. from an autobiographical sense. But I get the sense that uh, Names of the Women is also personal to you, not necessarily your story. It, it was very, very uh, personal. How so? Because of what we were talking about earlier, which is the way women have been written out of the story. And uh, I particularly thought about my grandmother, who is the person that I first heard the Bible stories from. Let's see from the dedications in the book, that would be... She's the first. Uh, Chachi Amma Jacob. Exactly. Tell me more. So when we were children and, and we used to go to the to my father's ancestral home in Kerala once every couple of years, uh, when we were in India at least once a year, um, there would be a Sunday service at home uh, that that my grandmother led. Unusual. And the thing about these Syrian Christian uh, services is they go on for an hour, a little over an hour. Wow. And for all that time, you have to stand. And these passages are recited from memory, a lot of it in Aramaic, a lot of it in Sans- Sanskrit. And my grandmother knew the entire thing. And the, the interesting thing was, which I discovered much later, this is not something expected of women. It All the priests in that Uh, church are men and they guard their territory very jealously they don't allow anybody in there Mm. she somehow learned this the entire service she would if we couldn't go to church that sunday if for some reason if there was some illness or something because also the the house was quite a distance from the church she would do it herself and we would all stand and whichever bits that you knew uh, you would uh, repeat with her. And I also noticed a very interesting thing. Many of the Aramaic passages, she did not understand, but she had memorized from when she was a child. You know, because this is a service that goes back 2,000 years in Kerala history. And she knew this from when she was a child. She uh, recited it when she was an old woman. And so for me, this book really is something very close to home. This story is amazing at almost every level. First, as a woman, she heads a service and Aramaic. I have never met anyone who knows someone who could say anything in Aramaic. Uh, Did you know her well? I did. Yeah, I did know her. And she was uh, another very, very important part of the story. She was the first storyteller in our family. Is that where you get it from? I don't know. It's clear from your books that you, they're sentient, you feel what you're writing. Yeah, I agree. And unusually, you do suffering without pity. Thanks. It's something I, I, I actually am conscious about, and I do try to do that. Because I think it's very easy to, uh, when you're describing certain events, it's very easy to fall into a kind of a false sentimentality or a, a, or a pity for a character, which I think drains that character and that event of uh, not just agency, but also interest, you know, because then it becomes a, a kind of a, a sentimental scene. And I think it's very important to uh, to guard against that. And it's so easy to do it, you know, because our your emotions do come into play even as a writer. They always come into play. Right. It is quite easy to crank up the melodrama, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. We don't exactly have a shortage of melodrama in our literature, do we? I mean, in a way, it's also a, a very sweet thing about the culture. Oh, I don't it's, know. You are being more charitable than I am. 
because you know melodrama used in context is one thing and but deployed at all times yeah, especially if it if it goes on for 500 pages <laughs> you don't suffer fools do you i mean no i you know i i i'm i have to say as i've grown older i've become very much more sympathetic with uh with with all kinds of writers because he, to write a book whatever kind of book it might be it you know you put a lot of yourself there and it's a, it's an exercise in vulnerability and humility and just a, a kind of a you're asking for trouble really yeah you know? i agree and i don't know i've i've got to the point where i would rather read a a failed novel than a critical take on that novel because at least the failed novelist has done some primary labor and has put their vulnerabilities out there for the world to take pot shots at true yeah there's there's some kind of honor there and you have to uh love them for it hmm. let's see you were one of the jury in uh, what was that the booker prize yes the international booker prize in 2020 this uh, empathy with authors that you speak of what skills do you have to bring to the table when you're a jury member wow what a what a great question uh, because what you have to do is you have to put aside what i was just talking about which is that love the love that one writer has for another writer you know failure or success mm-hmm. and uh you have to learn how to be ruthless how to be very cold in your appreciation of a, a work of art uh, and you have to learn how to distance yourself from your own judgments because that's the only way you can do it and especially and your biases and your biases absolutely your prejudices yeah because we all have them you know and isn't it the same when you edit or curate an anthology of work uh, i'm told that what you leave out is often more important than what you put in i mean such decisions are the worst aren't they they are the worst and the worst in a much more personal way because when you're part of a jury that's judging a prize there are six people to take the blame right when you're the editor of an anthology and even if there are 94 poets in that anthology as there were in mine there are still about 904 poets left out who will hate you forever i don't know if it's worth it to tell you well think of all the waiters in new york city who haven't made it to broadway <laughs> and, and who want to who want to spill the soup into the lap of every successful actor who walks in the door I dare say. And now we are talking about the Penguin Book of Indian Poets, almost a thousand pages. How did you put that together? How long did it take? So the the entire process took twenty years, but the the final thing took two years during the pandemic when I kind of sifted through this mountain of material, put together everything that had been done over the last twenty years over three other anthologies, and then. shaped it into this huge thing that luckily as i was doing it i had no idea how big it was i had no idea that it would run into almost 1000 pages from the standpoint of perpetuity i'm happy you did thanks i will dip into it every now and again no in fact that is the way to do it you just dip into it flip the pages till you come to a a line that resonates in your head that's it Do not ask yourself what does this poem mean. You are a writer and a poet and a musician. And at the end of this podcast you're going to perform for us. I'm good. I'm not going to perform but I'm going to send you something that you can use. No, we'll pretend that you did. All right, fine. Yes, I'm Ramji. I'm going to perform for you <laughs> at the end of this uh conversation with my trusty Who? band just waiting to <laughs> I'll get it together. <laughs> Hold on guys. For our listeners, there's a treat at the end of this podcast. After what's that word? There's a clip of Jitail performing his tune. Before we go, you mentioned the copy first edition copy of Ulysses. Now, Ulysses was first published by Shakespeare and Company in Paris, wasn't it? Oh, that was the Yes, that was the band edition published by 
Shakespeare and Company and later by uh, Grove Press, I think. And yeah. now it's a yeah. matter of lore, but there are all these stories of how that first edition was published by dint of a bank of typists typing up the book uh, because America wouldn't publish it. Yeah, and uh, it was published in, in the UK and then very quickly banned and removed. And then that case went on for, I think, for very many years. And what Grove Press, when Shakespeare and Company published in Paris, what they did very cleverly was in one of the editions, they included the court papers. Right. They made it so dramatic. And that's pure Maurice Girodias, the publisher of uh, Grove Press. He was just such a, a showman when it came to that kind of publishing. Now, you have a history with Shakespeare and company, don't you? I lived there for three months in my 20s mm -hmm. when I was penniless, when I ran out of money in Paris. The story? Uh, I happened to be living out of Gare du Nord, the station, where I'd left a bag in a locker. And if it was very cold, I would spend the night at the station. Hmm. Um, but one day I happened to be at Shakespeare and Company because, of course, I wanted to go there. I'd heard so many stories about it. And I was uh, uh, looking at the books. I couldn't afford to buy anything. Um, I found, I remember, a copy of uh, Jean Genet's The Thief's Journal, and I thought it would be appropriate to steal it. After all, it's The Thief's Journal. Huh. But then I looked around at the bookshop, and I realized this is a family-owned enterprise. There was just no way you could steal from a place like that. And as I was uh, pondering that ethical question, a man came up to me. He actually looked more homeless than I did. <laughs> uh, came up to me, this wizened old dude, uh, holding a cat that was absolutely immaculate, the cat, whereas he was absolutely the opposite of immaculate. You know? <laughs> a disreputable looking old man with this twinkle in his eye came up to me and pointed a finger at me and said, Dravidian? Really? <laughs> no. And I was just so shocked to be addressed in this fashion that I couldn't even lie about it. I said, yes. And he said, do you need a place to sleep? I said, yes. He said, and then he pointed at these things that I hadn't noticed before. On the first floor of the bookshop, there were these cots that looked like they were seating arrangements in the daytime, but they became beds in the night. And then, of course, I discovered that there were about a dozen people that George Whitman, which was the name of the old man who, who owned the shop, mm -hmm. he called them, he called us tumbleweed. And about a dozen tumbleweeds were put up at any one time. At the, and I became a tumbleweed. And the only uh, things that were expected of you as a tumbleweed, you had to work in the bookshop two hours a day, mm. which was stacking book. You had to write your autobiography in this big book he had at the bookshop. Be before you left, you had to write your autobiography. And... Uh, you were expected to read a book a day. None of this sounds like a hardship to me. Exactly, exactly. And the story behind his generosity is that uh, he had been a traveler in his youth and he'd been in India and came across so much hospitality in India, such absolute unconditional hospitality, that when he started this bookshop, he wanted to return that in a way. How fascinating. Uh, and you can still do that, right? You can still go back to Shakespeare and company and, and you can stay there. You can. I think it's much more organized now because uh, the business is now run by his daughter and, you know, they've become a little more organized in, in every way. Thank God the bookshop is just such a, a, a is thriving in a way it never had in the past. It's doing wonderfully. They are publishing just these gorgeous books. Uh, they, they published a kind of a history of Shakespeare and Company. They call it the history of the rag and bone shop of the heart with photos and uh, a lot of these autobiographies, including by some people who later became very well-known writers. Just a gorgeous piece of work. Really. Well, raise a glass of that bourbon that you've been drinking right through this interview. Two independent bookshops. Absolutely. May they, may they live long and prosper. And on that note, Jitail, thank you so much for being my guest today on The Literary City. Thank you for having me, Ranji. It's, uh, it's the most fun I've had in a long time. 
And that was the fabulous author Jeet Thail. Check the links in the podcast description to uh, where you can buy names of the women and uh, other of his books. And at the end of this podcast, there's Jeet Thail, the musician, performing with his band. And I'll be back with What's That Word? That fun segment where we look at words and phrases that we use all the time, but never stop to think about, right after this. And I'm back. This is What's That Word? And she is my co-host. Hello. My name is Praniti, but you can call me P. That's P with an A, not another E. Oh, that means people should spell you P-E-A, am I right? (laughs) Well, the alternative is not very flattering, is it? Well, there are not many other three-letter words ending in either E-A or E-E, are there? Well, let's see. There's... C, uh-huh. T, yeah. what else? Lee. Lee, what's that? You see, Lee with an A is a grassy field, you know, used for grazing animals. Mm. And Lee with an E is, well, roughly a, you know, a sheltered area, usually sheltered from the rain or wind or a storm, the elements, you know. Yeah. So a side of a ship or a plane that is away from the storm is called the leeward side. Also, you know, the leeward side of the mountain, the side that gets no rain. Yeah. And these are called homonyms, right? Exactly. So, are these also called portmanteau words? I know we did portmanteau in an earlier episode, but I wasn't sure about this. Uh, No, not really. You know, changing the meaning of a word by changing a single letter of it is called a gnomic mutation. That's boring. (laughs) Okay. Um, new pit then. New pit? Yeah. New pit. N-U-P-I-T. Ah, wow. I've never heard that word before. Well, I came upon it very recently. Interesting. How recently? Just now, when I said it. (laughs) What? Did you just make it up? Yes. (laughs) You can't just go around making up words. Tell that to Shakespeare. (laughs) He did thousand something. (laughs) One thousand words? 2,000 if you like. (laughs) Okay, I give up. But, you know, I love doing this show. Nice. Fun. Okay, P with an A, what's that word? Fun. Uh, I heard that. Is there an echo, but with artificial intelligence? (laughs) No, I'm right here. This is for real. Hmm. I was listening to the interview, and this is one of the Best mm-hmm. interviews you've done so far. Thanks. You know, I'm a big Jeet Thail fan. As am I. You guys had a wonderful conversation, you know, and mm-hmm. he ended the interview saying it was the most fun he'd had in a long time. Oh, that was kind of him. Yeah. But I thought, hey, that the word. Surely fun must have a fun etymology. <laughs> the word is fun. Good call. Enjoyment, amusement, lighthearted mirth. These are some of the dictionary definitions. Maybe in present usage. But let me tell you, the etymology of the word fun is no fun at all. Oh no, you're saying fun is not fun? <laughs> let's stop with the double entendre. But, but yes, you're right. Okay, let's get to the fun etymology. <laughs> okay, so to, to begin with, the word fun started out with an entirely different meaning. Ah, how so? Fun was probably derived from the Middle English word fonen. And fonen originally meant to fool someone or to befool someone, but not in a positive way or a fun way. It was literally to to fool someone, Hmm. to cheat someone, if you like. Makes sense in a weird way. You mean like April Fool's Day, right? Ah, yeah, I see that connection. And then in the late 17th century, let's call that about 1670 onwards, fun became consolidated as a verb, which means this time to cheat, actually, to perpetrate a hoax, you know, like to trick someone. Mm. In fact, in 1755, Samuel Johnson, in his famous A Dictionary of the English Language, did in fact label the word fun as a low cant word. You know, cant is like uh, argot or something where people use a certain word to exclude another group of people. But anyway, he said it was a low cant word. In his dictionary, he defined fun 
as a word for cheat or trick, indicating his disapproval of the words used. 1755. No. Yeah, but you know, forget the etymology part. Fun itself was frowned upon by the British aristocracy and consequently low cant. Right. Fun was considered to be French, a continental vice, they said, that had brought no good. <laughs> now, early Tudor historians point to uh, King Harold losing an eye during the 1066 Guerre d'Amusement, or Battle of Fun, as the first point at which French gaiety ruined England with these sentiments. <laughs> You know, fun was embraced initially by the by the court of Henry VIII. How fun came to be in Henry VIII's court is a little murky. Now, also, fun was a little difficult to have with all those beheadings that were going on, right? <laughs> no, it is it is rumored that fun was brought to the English court by Anne Boleyn, and as the relationship between uh, Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn sort of soured, Henry grew angry at the very idea of fun, and when Anne died, he had a sanction against all his future consorts and wives from having fun ever again. Right. I've heard this story. Anyway, so this is what led to the modern mnemonic that they used to keep track of uh, Henry VIII's six wives. It went like this. No fun, no fun, died, no fun, no fun, survived. <laughs> and it was not till the 18th century that fun itself became acceptable to British society, and therefore, so did the word. So that's when the word fun started to take on the connotation of it being a positive emotion rather than a device with which to cheat someone. Right. And somewhere in the middle of all this, Geoffrey Chaucer decided that he would amp up the word fun, and in the word fun, he brought fart jokes into it. <laughs> really? Chaucer, fart <laughs> yes. jokes. The father of, the father <laughs> of English literature. The father of English literature. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, wow! But this is totally fascinating. Then tell me, what did the British use to describe the emotion of fun that they were feeling? Well, there was mirth and there was jolly. These are all words from the 14th century. But in the time of Byron, they generally fainted. <laughs> hey, I would swoon for that Byron dude. Yes, and you would be called Lady Caroline Lamb to the Slaughter. <laughs> well done. And we're done. Ah, this was educational. Now comes the time to go and have some real fun. Bye. And that is our show. I'd like to thank my guest, Jeet Thayil, and my co-host, Pranati P with an A, Madhav, and you for the overwhelming number of subscriptions that we have received in the last few weeks. We're so glad you liked the show. And if you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Head on over and hit that subscribe button. Be alerted every time we have a new episode up and running. And now, as I promised, the treat, Jeet Thayil with this band performing the tune intriguingly titled Where the High is Held High. Enjoy it. I did. See you again soon. And the uh...